and this is History in the Kitchen. Welcome to History in the Kitchen this week, where we will be talking about the history of Labor Day, um, which is this weekend, and um, making some chili cheese dog cups, which are super yummy. I have a couple that I made already right here. These are great for any weekend barbecuing that you're doing. Hopefully you're doing that safely, um, or just to have as a snack during any kinds of like sporting game so hang on to this recipe it's a good one for uh it's a good one I feel like for fall and winter um so welcome and thank you for coming if you feel so inclined if you wouldn't mind share this video as you're watching because if you share more people uh, can come and I can teach more people and I love to do that um and if you would like to follow me my blog where I post the history lesson that I do plus the recipe every week is www.teachinghistoryherway.com and also on my blog I post things that I'm doing in my classroom. We go back to school this week in hybrid mode. I'm very excited to see my students and uh, so I'm going to post some tips and tricks and things that I'm doing in my classroom and also my general philosophy of teaching history so if you're interested go ahead and follow that and you can also find me on Instagram at teachinghistoryherway or on Twitter at just plain old history her way. I love hearing from you. I love talking to you. Um, and I love sharing what I do. Uh, teaching is my, one of my favorite things. So welcome. And I'm glad you're here. So the ingredients that you're going to need for today's recipe, by the way, today's recipe is so simple. So, uh, if you're not a cook, don't worry about that. You're going to need a, a can of canned chili, like Hormel chili. Uh, I have mine in here, but, uh, it's Hormel. It's actually pre-cooked and when I opened the can yesterday I was pleasantly surprised I don't think I've ever had canned chili before and it smelled really good and the hot dog cups taste really good so that's pretty awesome too you are going to need one egg and we're going to beat this egg because this is what's going to make the rim of the hot dog chili cup um, the chili cheese dog cup excuse me this is what's going to make the rim shiny and it's also going to help hold it together beware when you're pulling these out of the baking tin uh, out of your muffin pan actually it's going to, um, it, it, they're, they're soft because you're also going to need Pillsbury or any brand, but I prefer Pillsbury uh, biscuits. And we're going to be cutting these. And these are really, really soft, which is what makes them taste good and feel good when you eat them. But uh, when you're making a hot dog chili cup, a chili hot dog cup, excuse me, it's a, uh, it's a little tough to take them out of the, out of the baking tin. So just be a little careful about that. You're going to need Pam. I'm noticing a pattern. I use this almost every week and I prefer the Pam brand, but whatever brand of uh, cooking spray is fine. You're going to need some cheddar cheese. My, uh, my cups are going to be a mixture of both cheddar cheese. Um, and I'm also going to use some with diet cheese, do some with diet cheese because here's a secret. Whenever I cook anything that has dairy in it on history in the kitchen, I can only take the littlest tiniest taste to make sure that it tastes good, but then I can't actually eat it myself because I'm lactose intolerant, which is so annoying. So, um, mine are going to be a mixture of some sprinkled cheddar cheese on top for, for the rest of the people in my house. And then I want to be able to eat a couple of them to be honest so um mine are gonna have diet cheese on it and you're also going to need some hot dogs we prefer nathan's beef franks in our house but any kind of hot dog will be fine and we're gonna slice them up you're also going to need a knife um if you have a um a brush a, you're, you'll need one if you don't have a brush your fingers will be just fine you're going to need a muffin tin and a cutting board got it I was, uh, I was at Costco this morning and I saw that they had some silicone cutting boards. So next week's history in the kitchen, you might, uh, you might see some, you might see some Costco cutting boards. And yes, I do too believe Kelly that Thomas Jefferson would approve of the Pam. He was an inventor after all. So I agree. And, uh, today's sources, today's, uh, recipe is from delish.com. And, uh, the sources that I used for the information were the Constitution Center, the Smithsonian National and National Geographic. So we have a bunch of sources going on uh, here. So happy Labor Day. And also the reason why I'm making a hot dog dish is because get ready, wait for it. Today is the unofficial end of hot dog season. That's right, everyone. America has a hot dog season. And according to the National Hot Dog and Sausage Council, bet uh, between Memorial Day, so the unofficial beginning of summer, and Labor Day, the unofficial end of summer, Americans eat about 7 billion hot dogs. 
So, uh, in order to honor hot dogs and the unofficial end of hot dog season and just get a couple more hot dogs into that seven billion, we are making a hot dog dish today. So, let's get into the history of Labor Day and then we'll start making these and then we'll do a little more history, kind of like we do every week. Um, the first Monday in September is Labor Day every year in the United States. Other countries celebrate something like Labor Day too, um, but they, uh, they call it International Workers' Day and it's actually uh, observed in the world in May. Ours, however, is in September. And there's a reason why the one in the United States is observed on a different day than the one around the world. It grew out of the late 19th century labor movement. So basically, we're talking today about class. And I like to tell you every week that just like our recipes, history comes in layers and we need all of the ingredients to make history work. Today is a, is a class lesson. Today we're talking about workers. We're not talking about the people who own the business. We're not necessarily talking about small business owners. We are talking about the people who are working for business owners. So we're talking about the working class. And in the late 19th century, working conditions were, how should I put this? Abysmal. They were absolutely abysmal. People could and did work 12 hour days. There were no safety checks. So I know a lot of us get a, a little, our, our hair raises a little bit when we think about OSHA or we think about any of, the, any of the safety protocols that we have at work because we find them to be unnecessary sometimes, not during COVID, COVID safety measures are necessary. However, sometimes we have to remember that those safety measures come out of the actual blood and sweat and tears of workers in the 19th century who didn't have any legal protection against unfair labor practices. So working conditions were dirty, they were hot, it, it was unsafe, women, um, women in the factories would often get their hair cut, caught in machines, uh, children worked in coal mines and breathed in coal dust, uh, women who worked in the garment district were locked inside of their um, inside of their working spaces where it was hot and dusty and unhealthy. So uh, they didn't have any windows. So things were not good for the average worker, both skilled and unskilled in the late 19th century. So because working conditions were so poor, people got together and they formed unions. And in 1881, the, uh, the Knights of Labor, was a national union and they had about 700,000 members. And what's really cool about the K of L is that they let everybody in. So the K of L was not exclusive to white skilled workers. The K of L welcomed African-American workers who made up a large part of the, uh, of the, of the workforce. It welcomed in immigrants who made up a large portion of the workforce, and it welcomed not only skilled laborers, but also unskilled laborers. So your K of L was a union that accepted a, a lot of different kinds of people. And in 1881, they proposed setting aside one day annually to agitate for a shorter work day. Uh, part of their goal was an eight hour work day rather than a 12 hour work day, which is excessive. And, uh, and part of in, in the New York City um, K of L, they thought that an address should be read every single year annually as an emancipation of labor, or as a second declaration of independence. So basically, what we want to do is we want to liberate the worker from these horrible working conditions. And in the Baltimore K of L, they suggested that the first Monday of September would an, would be an annual day to protest for that eight hour work day. The New York City KFL, however, wanted the May 1st date. So that doesn't end up happening. 1881, we have this first proposition for us to have some sort of organized way of demanding legislation to make work day, the workday and working conditions fair for people. But it takes actually a few years for, the, for that to get rolling because it's really hard to organize all of these workers. There were 700,000 of them, different workers in different regions of the United States have different ideas about what they want and how they should go about getting it. So it's rough organizing. So September 5th, 1882, the unions of New York City inspire other unions. They decide to have a parade to celebrate their members and to support all workers and, and all unions. 20,000 people um, attended that 
particular parade on September 5th, 1882. And the workers who went to the parade actually had to give up a day's pay to go there. So that's how badly these people wanted a decent, fair work day, decent, fair working conditions. They were willing to give up an entire day's pay in order to protest to get that. And these parades were generally, in 1882, they were generally peaceful. People protested, they marched with signs, and um, spirits were high, workers had each other's backs. All right, let's get our recipe started and then we will uh, continue with the history of Labor Day, which is actually gonna get a lot more violent than you would expect. Today, we think of Labor Day as a day where we can go to lots of sales. And it's kind of interesting that Labor Day is a day that we're supposed to reflect on, um, reflect and rest from work when retail workers are out at work dealing with our sales. Um, and Labor Day is a day when a lot of people have parades. It actually started out pretty violently. All right, so first thing that we're going to do for our recipe is you are gonna pop open those biscuits. So whatever refrigerated dough you have or refrigerated biscuit you have, you're gonna take it out and we're gonna take them and we're gonna actually, it kind of reminded me yesterday of filleting them. We're gonna cut them in half. Um, and that's going to be the base of our cup. So I'm gonna do a couple. Should look like this when you're all finished. So you should have two. Neither should be too thin. If you, uh, if you mess up, don't worry about it because you can just kind of stick them back together. That's the beauty of it being dough. Um, so this is a nice little shortcut recipe. And remember, we're celebrating also the end of hot dog season, but that doesn't mean you can't have hot dogs after hot dog season. It's not like wearing white after Labor Day, which by the way, I also looked up. So as we keep, uh, as we keep slicing these, there is no general historic consensus about the you can't wear white after Labor Day fashion um, advice, but part of part of the history that I read is also about class because remember we're talking about class today, and um, basically by the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s, there was a lot of quote unquote new money. So people who had not who are not coming from rich families, but they're self made. Uh, wealthy people and the ladies of wealthy old wealthy families of old money families decided that they needed a way to differentiate and kind of embarrass the uh, ostentatious new money women so they decided to make this rule that you don't wear white after labor day otherwise you're not classy and then they didn't tell the women that were new money so you could always tell who was old money and new money depending on who was wearing white after labor day thought that was pretty interesting all right, so we should be almost done cutting these. And you may need to bake twice. You might have more dough than you have muffin cups in your muffin tin, and that is also okay. All right, so now that we've got these all cut, yeah, seriously, Mean Girls, you can't sit with us. All right. Next thing you wanna do is you wanna take out your pan, spray your cups before you put the dough in, you want to spray your cups. So let's do that. Not too much because then they'll be greasy, but you need enough so that these don't stick because I promise you if they stick, they get, they get messy and they get gloppy because you're taking out all the really wonderful stuff that's inside the cup. All right. So you want to do your best to get it so that the dough will hang off of the top. And that actually takes a little bit of patience and practice. And for the sake of time, I might not do all of these just because I wanna make sure I honor your time. I know it's Labor Day weekend and I'm really grateful for those of you who are here. Thank you for giving up time on your Labor Day weekend to be with me and cook with me. I look forward to this all week. This is a holiday. Um, and also while you're hanging out, if you wanna share, this video as we go along, that would be super too. This way maybe we can get more people to pop in and learn what this holiday is all about. All right, so by May 1st, 1886, we finally had some organization amongst workers and they planned something called May Day. So workers and their allies took to the streets and gave speeches, they chanted, they waved red flags, Workers spoke about the dismal working conditions that they were dealing with and they demanded justice. Basically, what they wanted was pretty simple. And I want you to think about this because a lot of people at this time grew to really hate labor unions. They really despised them. And because labor unions were working for the following. 
a livable wage. It's always nice to make enough money to have food, shelter, and clothing, and clean water, right? I think so. Uh, they also wanted a safe working environment. It is wonderful to go to work and not be afraid that you are going to get sick or die, okay? And lastly, they wanted an eight hour work day. Nobody wants to work all day long with no break. So they were basically looking for fair working conditions. And um, on May 1st, 1886, they got together to, um, to talk about that and to make it known. And they were really, really organized. So they had this day of protest. The Federation of Organized Trade and Labor Unions organized this national strike campaign. And May Day was generally supported by all of the trade unions. Um, and, organi and organizations that were made so that workers had a voice. So that was May, uh, and on May 3rd, or sorry, that was on May 1st, but it ended up being more than a day. So on May 3rd, 1886, several unarmed workers were killed by, um, by the police in McCormick Worker, uh, excuse me, McCormick Reaper Works in Chicago. So the protests didn't just end on May 1st. And part of the things that unions had to deal with were, was, um, was violence by union members. It was really hard to, um, to organize everybody. And even in, um, even in the K of L, the, uh, the skilled workers actually grew to resent the unskilled workers. So you then have like this division in, within the working class and the, um, and the people who were in the, um, who were in the K of L, the skilled workers were in the K of L, they left and they actually formed the American Federation of Labor uh, just for themselves to get themselves away from the unskilled workers and the African-American workers and the immigrant workers. Um, so on May 1st uh, in 1886, there were 80,000 workers in Chicago that were marching, 30,000 in New York City and 300,000 workers nationwide who were marching for fair wages. And between May 1st and May 3rd, by May 3rd, you do have these unarmed workers who are killed at the McCormick Reaper Works in Chicago who continue to protest. May 4th, uh, another protest was planned. And on May 4th, uh, we have something that's known as the Haymarket Affair. It was a protest that was organized for 7.30 p.m. on May 4th, 1886 um, in the Haymarket part of Chicago. And it was meant to, uh, it was a rally actually against the police killings of the workers on uh, the day before on May 3rd. They expected a crowd, the people who organized it expected a crowd of 200,000 people, but fewer than 2,500 people attended and the speakers didn't even show up. So we have a break in solidarity once we get to, once we get to May 4th. Then to make matters even worse, a bomb went off in, um, someone threw dynamite and nobody really knows who who threw the bomb how it ex well we know how it exploded we know science but we don't know why uh we know why it exploded somebody was angry but we don't know who was angry about what we don't know which side threw the bomb the people supporting the labor unions or the people who were against the labor unions so the local police panic when they hear a bomb who wouldn't panic when you hear an explosion i know i would i hear a car backfire outside and i'm like ah so you have this bomb that goes off in the middle of Haymarket and the local police panic. They shoot without direction and it's 7.30 p.m. It's dark. Um, well, it's not quite 7.30. It's more closer to 8, but it's dark. They're shooting into darkness. They're shooting into twilight and seven police officers and, uh, and four civilians died um, at, in the Haymarket affair. And remember, the Haymarket affair was in protest to workers dying uh, the, the night before. So now labor unions look really terrible. And part of the historic theory is maybe this was done to make the unions, the, the dynamite was thrown to make the unions look terrible. It looks like absolute anarchy because what ends up happening is eight leaders of the labor movement went to court. They had a very swift trial and they were found guilty for conspiring and inciting violence. So now the labor unions who want fair wages, who want to be behind their people, who want good working conditions, now look like a violent mob. Let's take a moment and think about that. I'm not going to talk about the present day, but I want you to think for a moment what outside, what people who are outside a movement who are against it can make a movement look like. Just think about it for a minute. All right. So now our people who just want 
an eight hour workday, who want fair working conditions. They look like a totally violent mob of a mess. Great. So is anybody gonna listen to them at this point? Probably not. So the affair heightens anti-union sentiment and people begin to support, poli um, support political intervention that upholds labor exploitation. So people are supporting the other side. Yeah, let them work for 12 hours a day. They're violent. They cause explosions. Great, that's not what these people wanted. So um, May Day actually ended up being suggested as Labor Day, but the president at the time, President Cleveland, feared that May Day would, be, quote, become a memorial to the hate market radicals. And rather than making Labor Day a national holiday, uh, he pressed states to choose the September date for Labor Day. All right, let's take a break there and move on to the next step. I only did six of them. I should have done more while I was talking, but then I got excited about dynamite, really sorry. Okay, so next step is your chili. You're gonna take a heaping spoonful of chili and you're gonna put it in each cup. Now, don't fill the cup all the way to the top because if you do that, you're not gonna have any room for the hot dog goodness, okay? So we're gonna stick some chili in each of these. We also wanna make sure that the cup is up and over this, the dough, excuse me, is up and over the side of each um, of each muffin cup because we don't want to lose the dough. Okay. So we're going to take a nice spoonful, put a little spoonful in there. Please remember, don't fill up the cup. That is not what you want to do because then there's no room for the hot dog and the cheese, and then you don't have a chili cheese dog, then you have Hormel chili inside a Pillsbury biscuit, and that is not our recipe today. Though I imagine that would taste good. Now, if you're feeling super ambitious, at some point, someday, you can make your own chili and fill your own chili in your own, uh, in your own biscuit batter, and, um, and yeah, that would be pretty cool. All right, next step in our recipe. Take these, I'm gonna move them out of the way so that, um, so that we don't get the hot dog meat on the biscuits. All right, so next you're gonna take hot dogs. And I did the math this morning. This should take about, this should take six hot dogs, this recipe. So I'm gonna put these back here so you can see what I'm doing. And you're gonna cut your hot dogs into pieces like this. I'm actually maybe a little bit thinner, okay? So here we go. And you're going to put them right in with the chili. Put about five of them in on top of the chili. That's your next step. And if you have a moment, um, preheat your oven to 325. All right, I can talk and do this at the same time. Okay, so last we left off, we left off with Grover Cleveland pushing for May not to be Labor Day, for September to be Labor Day because of the, um, because of the Haymarket Affair. So Haymarket Affair happens on May 4th, 1886. And by the time we get to after that, um, right after that, Grover Cleveland is pushing for a Labor Day, a day for reflection on labor practices and stuff to happen not on that day because he doesn't want to memorialize what he calls them Haymarket Radicals, even though we're not 100% sure if there were people in the labor movement who actually threw the bomb. All right, so let's fast forward a couple of years to uh, May 11th, 1894. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Pullman strike. So the workers at the Pullman Palace Car Company, which was a railroad manufacturer near Chicago, went on strike to protest a few things. They were protesting low wages. People deserve to get paid for what they're doing, right? They um, were protesting sudden layoffs. So they want job security. Can't blame them there. And get ready for this. They were also protesting not a 12 hour work day, they were protesting a 16 hour work day. So the people who were working at the Pullman Palace Car Company were working for 16 hours a day, manual labor. So um, just think about why they might not want to do that, okay? So that's when they have, that's when their strike starts. It starts on May 11th. By June 22nd, the members of the American Railway Union also jump in to support the people that work at Pullman, uh, at the Pullman Palace Car Company. And what they do to join the struggle is they refuse to move any cars made by Pullman 
from one railway to another. So let's imagine, if you will, rail cars that can't move from one track to another track. It causes rail traffic. Um, for those of you who are not from the tri-state area or who don't live in or around a city or have never taken the train to get into or out of a city, there is there are a few things I dislike more than when there's rail traffic on the way out of New York City after a long day. Even if it's a long fun day where I'm like going to see a Broadway show, which hopefully we'll be able to do again soon enough. Or if I'm working in the city that day, or even if I'm at, uh, I'm at the Met, all I want to do at the end of the day is go home and then there's rail traffic. Now, rail traffic doesn't just affect commuters. Rail traffic also affects goods and services. Goods cannot get from one place to another. So by messing up rail traffic, these people at Pullman and the people at the American Railway Union are really making a statement saying, we want our workers to be treated fairly. Okay, so here's how this sort of ends, kind of. So in Washington, D.C., politicians are starting to panic. Uh, and they figure they need to placate the labor mu uh, union somehow. They need to appease these strikers. So what Congress does is they pass a bill making Labor Day a national holiday, and it's signed on the 28th of June. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. I mean, the bill was kind of on the floor already anyway, but they were just like, all right, you know what? Let's do this and sign it. So Grover Cleveland signs it. It's done. However, days before signing the Labor Day bill, Grover Cleveland ordered federal troops to Chicago. So that's the National Guard. So Grover Cleveland sends the National Guard out on these workers who are uh, basically agitating for, remember, they want higher wages, they want, to, they want to work less than 16 hours a day, and they want sudden layoffs to stop. So that's what they're agitating for. That's why these rail guys are on strike. And um, he sends the National Guard in to end the boycott. So the strikers rise up on July 7th. Now, the things that I was reading, um, the history stuff that I was reading called this a riot. I won't call it that. And the reason I won't call it that is because the people at Pullman, all they wanted was to be treated like human beings. They wanted a fair work day and a fair wage, and they wanted job security. By the people who own the railroad companies, um, in this particular, uh, case the people who own the Pullman Palace car company who are very very rich okay so um, I'm, I'm not going to call it a riot because a riot has the language that we use is really powerful the language we use in everyday life is really powerful and the language that we use in history when we teach history when we talk about history it's really powerful riot indicates negativity that they were doing something wrong and by refusing to do their job until they were given fair treatment that's not necessarily wrong. They weren't killing anyone. They were stopping traffic. They were trying to make a point to people who were more powerful than they were. So we are going to call it a rising up. So on July 7th, which also happens to be my birthday, but not in the 1800s, that would make me very old. Um, the, um, the guys at Pullman rose up against the National Guard um, and they were just a crowd. They didn't bring, they didn't, as far as I've read, there were no guns there. There, they were, they were just yelling and they had their signs. Um, then the National Guardsmen fired into the crowd and 26 strikers were killed. So the Pullman strike and the resulting actions by the federal government actually aggravated class tensions and workers end up distrusting the government because they don't understand why is the National Guard coming to our strike to make it stop when we're being treated unfairly? Why isn't the government instead making legislation to make, uh, to make business owners treat us fairly? Um, and the federal government actually sympathized with employers. So there's a lot of distrust going on. Um, so the way we got to Labor Day was actually pretty violent. If you think back to all of the things that we talked about with the Haymarket Affair, with poor working conditions, with low pay, with the Pullman strike, with the National Guard shooting into the crowd at the Pullman strike. So, um, so Labor Day today, where we have parades and picnics, is not the way that Labor Day started. However, because of all the violence, labor unions looked around and they were like, we're not going to get anything accomplished if we have this... Um, if we have if we have this connotation so what labor unions did and this is not all workers and i don't have an opinion on this i'm just letting you know what happened what labor unions did is um 
They and other labor activists distance themselves from the violence of Haymarket and May Day. Um, and what they do is instead they push patriotic stars and stripes in celebrations. So instead of organized chaos, they decide that the, um, the parades and picnics were the way to go for workers who favored Labor Day and also workers who favored Labor Day saw themselves as law-abiding citizens who worked within the system and as worthy of better working conditions. I would like to remind all of you that our First Amendment rights say that protest, that assembly is within the system. Okay, so let's just remember that when when these people protested, when they decided that they wanted to have better working conditions, they did work within the system. A protest is our First Amendment right, a petition is our First Amendment right, and it is legal. The violence, we're not sure where it came from in Haymarket. So let's keep that in mind together. So Labor Day today is uh, considered to be a time and a space to reflect on the hardships that workers have overcome, to strategize for a better future, and as a reminder that employers and companies cannot and should not take advantage of their workforce. So that's what Labor Day is all about. Let's sprinkle some cheese on top of these delicious, delicious chili hot dog cups so that you can hopefully enjoy them soon. Um, and also think about, uh, think about this. Do you, um, do you know anybody or are you related to anybody who is in a union? If you're a teacher watching, you might be a part of a teacher's union. Um, my father-in-law, who I love very much, is part of the food workers union. So I kind of learned a little bit about how unions work today uh, through him and through him talking about that. Oh, and that one is just going to be a chili cup because I was talking too much history and I forgot to put the, put the chili in. All right, so I'm going to put these in, not yet, because I need to do my egg. So crack your egg. You're probably not going to use all of it unless you choose to make um, a whole lot of these. Uh, you can make, I think the recipe tells me that I can make 24. So I'm gonna, okay. I want to make sure we beat this egg. This is how, this is my preferred fast way to do it. And we're going to take our brush and we're just going to brush the edges. Creates a little bit of stability and it also makes them look pretty. Now, before you put these bad boys into the oven, what you are going to 100% want to do is make sure that there's not cheese all over the pan. Uh, because I don't know about you or how much you bake, but when I bake with cheese, I don't like cleaning a pan that has melted burned cheese all over it. So I'm gonna clean my pan before I throw these into, um, before I throw these into the oven. Now these are gonna go in the oven at 325 for between 25, uh, between 20 and 25 minutes. I found that 20 minutes was plenty last night to make it so that they have this nice golden edge. So this is what you want the outer edge to look like. My top is nice and um, it's nice and brown, but it's not uh, but it's not burnt. So keep an eye on these. If you have an oven that tends to run a little bit hot, um, make sure that you take them out a little bit early. Um, otherwise, keep an eye and you can leave them in for an extra couple of minutes if your cheese isn't melted. The beauty of this is that most of it's cooked except for the biscuit. So, um, all right. So Danny said her dad was a committeeman in the United Auto Workers. Oh, wow. How cool is that? I have to tap on see more. Hold on a second, Danny. My husband is the president of his local and I belong to our local teachers union. That's awesome. So Labor Day is really your holiday, Danny. Cool. Thank you. And thank you to you and your husband and your dad for continuing to fight for the rights of, uh, for the rights of workers, for the rights of teachers, um, and all others. So that's great. Thanks, Danny, for sharing that. All right. I'm going to throw these in the oven real quick. Okay. So I hope that you enjoyed this week's History in the Kitchen. I hope you enjoy eating your chili dog cups. I cannot wait to eat these. I'm gonna make my Daya ones um, in my next batch. And um, I hope you will continue to join me for History in the Kitchen. You can catch the rest of this episode on YouTube afterwards, or you can go back to Facebook because Facebook keeps these live videos up. 
Um, on YouTube, my channel is Teaching History Her Way. Just like everything else, I not only put these up, but I also have some tech tools that I found useful for virtual learning and some other uh, some other teachers, teacher and student tutorials that um, I've, I've found to be helpful for myself and for others. Um, and if you want to follow me on Instagram or um, yeah, on Instagram, Teaching History Her Way, or on Twitter, I'm just History Her Way. You can give this video a share if you want to support me a little bit so that I can teach as many people history uh, as I can, because my main goal is that people understand that history is made by people of every shade. So keep looking at those layers and let's keep finding people that aren't necessarily talked about because we need to know about everybody for the American story. You have a great week. Have a wonderful Labor Day holiday. If you're starting school this week, have a wonderful first week of school. If you've already started school, have just a regular great week of school and I will see you next Saturday. Oh, very quickly before you go, um, History in the Kitchen is going to be, um, is going to be celebrating uh, Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month. So if you know of any good recipes that you would like for me to include when I'm talking about um, the history of Hispanic Heritage Month, I would love for you to send them my way. Um, Hispanic food um, and, uh, and Latinx food, which is different than Hispanic, and we'll go over that next week. Um, that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. It's not something that I cook very often, so I would really appreciate a recipe um, and my viewers' help. Okay. So you have a wonderful week, and I'll see you next week at 3 p.m. on Saturday for History in the Kitchen.